Everybody, we are finishing up our week of prayer and fasting here, and uh, man, has it been a powerful week in somebody's life? Yeah. yeah. We've had just a fantastic time coming together every morning and praying and, and uh, seeing God move and getting closer to God. I, I really would love to hear a story. If you've got a story of something that, that God's already answered, maybe your prayer, or you, you just have something you'd like to share, uh, please let us know, because we would love to capture that or be able to share that with other people and inspire them. Um, and, uh, you know, I've already had several people ask me, uh, when is the next time? We do one every January and every every August, because I've, I've got people that have had to miss because of work this week, and they don't want to do that in January. So as soon as we get those dates, we've got a couple of January things that are bouncing around. And in the next month or so, we'll finalize that. We'll let you guys know so you can go ahead and plan for that. Um, it's just, it's been great. That's all I got to say about that. Well, hey, if you are a guest, if you're here for the first time, we're in a series we've been doing called Jesus Said. You can probably tell that from all around me. And uh, today we're on part five of this series. And so if you've missed any of the others, if you've been on vacation or this is your first time, uh, then you can simply go and catch up online or on our website. And uh, the this, this, this series has such a simple premise. What we are trying to do is simply condense time. Uh, the reality is we, we read the Bible as spectators sometimes, and we're, we, we just think, well, I'm glad I wasn't there. I didn't have to be there in that moment. That was a tough moment. But we're actually trying to put ourselves there because what we want to do is go back to some of the tough things Jesus said, some of the challenging things, and imagine that he looks you right in the eyes and he says it to you. And then we have to answer the question, what am I going to do with what Jesus said? That's what the whole series is about. We're taking one of those tough things each week. He said so many that we're probably going to be doing a Jesus Said series every year for many years to come, but we're just looking at a handful of those right now. So, hey, uh, if you've been around Grace Life any period of time, you already know that I used to be a school teacher, right? Most of you know that. Um, and when I was teaching school, I was actually a band director. That meant I taught the coolest class in school. Come on, band people with me, anybody? Band geeks, that's right. There were a lot of football players just gave me a scowl right now, just so you know. <laughs> That's, that's too bad. Anyway, look, here's the reason that's important is because I was always jealous of my math teacher friends because they, they only had 18 students at a time because they only had 18 textbooks and they only had 18 desks. And somehow that was like some kind of reasonable limit. They don't care about limits with band directors. I had to teach 330 students a day. And, and the reason I'm telling you that is just so you understand the story here. When, when you teach 330 students a day and then you start traveling places with those 300 and something kids and then you start doing performances with 300 and something kids, it's very, very important that everybody actually does the right thing at the right time. Y'all know what I'm saying? Like, if you've got 300 kids out on the field and they're all in those little uniforms, uh, look, we can just go ahead and admit, I'm a band director, I'll even admit, those things are dorky, aren't they? I mean, they got like feathers on their heads. That's all I got. You know, it's just weird. But anyway, if you got all of them out there except one, because one didn't pay attention and showed up like in Birkenstocks and a tie-dye t-shirt, that's going to look a little odd, right? Or if, if everybody's on the bus to go somewhere and one kid is still at home in the bed, that's going to be a problem, right? And so it was really important for me not only to teach my students to play their instruments, but to teach them to actually follow instructions. And so I would, I would give a test. And I uh, started doing this about the eighth grade. I would teach them from sixth grade to 12th grade. And sixth graders are sweet and seventh graders are just there. Eighth graders, well, that's when the devil has proved he is upon the earth. <laughs> and it's also when we start traveling. And so it's when I really need kids to, to pay attention to what I'm saying. And so I would give a written test, like four or five page written test, which was already the first problem because for some reason, band students think they are not supposed to have to do anything with a pencil. <laughs> and so I had this test that I gave out, and it wasn't a music test, which is what really started to confuse them. I would throw a couple of music questions in there just for the fun of it, but I put algebra questions in there. I put history questions in there. I put grammar questions in there, and they were always getting really, really confused. Matter of fact, about question number 25, I would always have them do something weird like, stand up and yell your name. And as I would give out the tests to everyone, 
The first thing that I would say to the entire class is be sure to read the entire test before you begin. Who in here would have done that? Okay, there are about five of you. I won't tell you what the rest of us think of you. <laughs> Just kidding, we love you. Anyway, here's the point. Most people don't do that. And so what would happen is they would start taking the test and somebody would get to the algebra question and say, Mr. Kurtz, may we use a calculator? I'm like, sure, I don't care. Wait a minute, if you're giving me a test, why do you not care? That's when the, you could see the wheels start turning for a few people. And, and you could wait, and there was always a clarinet player. God bless clarinet players. I don't know why, but it always was. This excited little clarinet player to apparently be the first person to question number 25 who jumps up, Susie, as loud as she could and embarrassed herself in front of the whole class. For a few minutes, she was really proud of herself because she got there. And then later she started noticing there weren't as many people jumping up and yelling their names. Matter of fact, as soon as I gave out the test, there was that one kid, usually a trumpet player, but anyway, <laughs> who actually turned their test in within two minutes or so because they actually read everything. And on the last question that says, don't do any other question, write your name and turn in your test. Exactly. See, the thing is, though, most of us are not real good at following instructions without question, especially when we don't like the instructions. See, I'm one of those people that actually rationalizes whether or not I need to follow instructions. Like, why would I read every one of these only to come back and read them again? I can just answer them as I'm reading them. What is the point of reading all the way through it? Now, how many people think like me? Yeah, and that is why the world is so sinful. Okay, there you go. <laughs> But the point I'm making today is this very kind of thinking, as well as the reason that I would give that test to my students, brings up one of the most challenging things that Jesus ever said. If you've got your Bible, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Everybody else will be on the screen right here, but watch this. This is what Jesus said, one of those mic drop moments. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? I don't know. Some of y'all can just go ahead and go on to lunch right now. I mean, y'all kind of got... That, that's tough, Jesus, like seriously. By the way, before we really start looking at how hard it is to respond to that, let me just give everybody a nerd moment that'll help you read the Bible better. If you've ever read the Bible and when you are reading, you see the word Lord and it is all capital letters. Anybody ever notice sometimes in your Bible the word Lord is all capital letters and you've wondered why is that? That's usually in the Old Testament. And what it actually means is the name of God. It represents the word Yahweh, one of God's names, his personal name that he gave to the people of Israel. And so anytime you see Lord in all capital letters, it means Yahweh. It does not mean what we're about to talk about. However, in this passage, if you guys will put that back on the screen for everybody, you'll notice that it's normally spelled lowercase, the word Lord, like you're used to seeing it if you write it in English. And so in this case, the word means master or sir. It means you're in charge. You're the one with authority. It's a sign of respect. And, and what Jesus is pushing back on us, he says, why do you come up and give me some title of respect and honor, but then you don't do what I say? What, what he's trying to get is this. Everybody follow this. Honor without authority is flattery. To give honor to someone in authority but not obey their authority is mere flattery. Jesus is saying, why, why y'all coming and trying to be all respectful, but then you turn around and ignore every word? That's tough, isn't it? And then he goes on and explains the response that, that they should have. He says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he's like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. This is one of the simplest Bible stories. We teach it to our kids down the hall. Some of you who grew up going to church, you. You learned this in Sunday school and you even learned the song that went along with it. I'm not gonna sing it for all of your sake, but it's the, 
the wise man built his house upon the rock, the white, you know, that sort of little thing. It's just such a simple concept. The wise man does this, and then the other side is the fool does that, right? The fool builds his house on the sand, the wise man builds his house on the rock. Who wants to be a fool? Anybody want to be a fool? Who wants everybody to look around at you and go, what a fool you are? So see how simple this is? We all want to be wise. We all know what to do. Build our house on the rock. If this is so simple, if we can teach it to our kids, then why do we, especially as adults, struggle so much to do what Jesus said? Y'all with me? I mean, why do we struggle so much? Look, there are two answers, and the first one is the whole reason we're doing the series. That is just the obvious fact that some of the things he said to do are just not so easy, right? I mean, it, it's a little hard. He says, love your enemies. And you're like, Jesus, have you seen my enemies? Like, you want me to love these people? You're lucky I don't back over them with a truck, man. I mean, you should just be happy I leave them here, right? You know? Jesus says, well, actually, I know what it's like to have enemies. You remember me on the cross saying, Father, forgive the people that just put me here? Ooh, yeah, that's why we're doing these one sentence at a time, one week at a time to kind of process. He says, look, forgive because you're forgiven. Doesn't matter how you feel. It's like, well, you don't know how I feel. I want to drop back over them with a the truck. I mean, you know, it's hard to do what Jesus says sometimes. Again, the point for the series. But what I think God wants us to, to dig a little deeper and, and see today in this passage is the real reason that we struggle to do what Jesus said. And that is that we don't really understand who is talking. Y'all are all kind of like, I'm not gonna take the bait there, Jimmy. Because Jesus said, so it should be obvious, Jesus is talking, but what do you mean by that? Yeah, Jesus is talking, but Jesus said a little something that made that a little more complex. Here's what he said in John chapter 12. He says, for I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me, he commanded me to say all that I've spoken. And, and I know that his command leads to eternal life, so whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. In other words, Jesus is like, I, I don't take credit nor blame. I am only sharing with you the heart of the Father. Anything that comes out of my mouth, the Father spoke to me first. So here's our real problem with what Jesus said today, everybody. It's the heart of the father looking at his children, saying, why do you call me Lord, but you don't do what I say? You see, it's really easy for us to get the idea of, of liking what Jesus did, because, you know, Jesus doesn't show up until, you know, you know, back here. There we go. Jesus is like right about here. And he does all of the fun stuff, right? You know, we call it the good news. This is the good news portion of the Bible. I've actually heard people say, then does that mean this is the bad news? I don't know. That's, that's your own personal joke there. But we're all like, well, we love hippie Jesus. He was so sweet. He was so kind. He had long hair. He had his little burlap skirt thing, dress thing, shirt thing that he walked around in, wore sandals, didn't care much for materialistic stuff. And he talked about love all the time. Love your enemies. Uh, God loves you. And he just talks about love. And, and, and we just, think everything is so fun in here. We're like, okay, I will do that. I, Jesus said series, that's really good. Go ahead and think about this. If, if that said, God said, how many of you would invite a neighbor? Exactly. Because we know that whatever God said would be a little harsher than the, the nice hippie Jesus stuff. Because over here is the mean old daddy sitting up in heaven with lightning bolts in his hands, just ready to strike you at any minute. I'm, I'm just trying to help you with the way most people see God in the Bible. That's the reality, isn't it? Here's our problem. Jesus said, I only say what the Father said. Anything that comes from me is the heart of my Father. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father because the Father and I are one. So anything that he says is actually the heart of the Father being revealed. And then he went on to say, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. And that was what the Jews would have called their scripture at the time, which is our Old Testament, that we like to think, well, I don't have to deal with all that stuff. That's the Old Testament. That's, that, that's for then. Let me flip over here to the, the Jesus stuff. That's what I'll read and that's what I'll talk about. But here's a problem. Let's go back over here. If Jesus says, I did not come to abolish this, I did not come to erase this, I actually came to fulfill every single requirement. And you know what else that means? That I have to point out in 2021? 
It also means that he didn't come to edit it or correct it because if he came to fulfill it, it clearly was not in error. And it also means that it did not need to be culturally updated. <laughs> Jesus said it, don't throw things at me. It's, it's tough because what we have to come to realize is this is all of what Jesus said. The Bible also tells us that Jesus is the word of God made flesh. Jesus is revealing the Father to us when he walked in the flesh. To understand the heart of Jesus and to do what nice hippie Jesus said also means to do everything because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all equally God. That's one of the great mysteries of our faith, and we'll do a sermon on, on the Trinity another day, but that's the reality of it. And so it leads us back to the, the point, and, and that is if we're going to do what Jesus said, if, if it's really when he says, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say, if it's really the Father in heaven speaking to all of his children saying, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say, then our answer is obvious. We have to do what God said, any of it and all of it. Now, I want to take a pause, if I could, right here, because I know some of you are like, I, I got to get out of here. There there's no way I can do all of that, because some of that's not even true scientifically, historically, some of it this, we got a problem with that, and well, then there's, this, and we've got all kinds of just questions and challenges, and the truth is, I don't know a person who has come to faith and started reading the Bible that did not have a question. If you didn't, I'm... I need to meet you, you'd be the first person ever. We all have questions because there is something in here that confronts every one of us that says something we don't like. There's something in here that makes us change, like read the entire test before you start. Why, I don't wanna do it that. There's something in here that doesn't make sense to us until after we've learned to do what God says. There are questions that your science teacher would say, and there are questions a history teacher or you know, someone would raise some kind of objection. We've all had them, right? Everybody has them. So I want to give you permission. If you're on a journey of faith and you're saying, just do it, seriously, man, aren't we past that kind of thing? That's what people said 50 years ago. Now we understand there are questions. Yes, I'm giving you permission to ask questions. Is that okay? I'm giving you permission to approach the Bible and ask questions. And then I'm encouraging you, matter of fact, telling you, I think before God you're obligated to get answers to your questions. Ask, ask, but here's the point. And maybe all of your science teachers won't tell you this, some will. There is an answer to anything that has ever been challenged or raised or questioned about the Bible. There is. And really smart people with like PhDs in science and stuff and, and people with PhDs in history and archeology, span there, there is nothing in here that cannot be answered and with academic integrity. You guys follow what I'm saying? So ask your questions. Go talk to a pastor and say, I don't like this. This, this talk to me about this. What? And, and get answers because we've got to be able to trust this as God's word. Here's the reason. If there's no other book, and forgive me for just using the word book for a minute, but can you follow me? There is no other book, there's no other source that also says God loves you so much. thousands of years before you were ever born, before he had ever done one thing right or one thing wrong, that he loved you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross, a death you would have needed to die otherwise, so that you can be forgiven, have eternal life and fellowship with God that is not broken the way it is now here upon this earth. If you cannot trust this as the word of God, hear me, your biggest problem is not something the Old Testament says. Your biggest problem is you have no answer for sin and no hope for eternity. Amen. So I, I want to encourage you, since it was Jesus who said, whatever I say, the Father saying, so therefore it's the Father who said, why not do what I tell you? I want to encourage you, ask your questions, but get answers because there are answers. Matter of fact, I was throwing a real quick plug because there's the whole reason we did this. We did a series simply called The Bible. I think it was about a year or so ago. It's on our website, it's on our app. I did it in research with 
uh, a scientist and, and a whole lot of other folks that helped out and he even helped present the information. And I just wanna encourage you, the questions that you have, like it, how can I trust this? Start there. And then whatever other questions you have, come and talk to a pastor and, and there are websites dedicated to help answering how you can actually trust the Bible in our age with what we know about science and history. I promise you there are good answers there because the reality is some of us today, our problem is not the difference between what Jesus said or what the Father said. Our problem is how could God have said any of it? After all, men are the one that put their hands to the pen, right? There are answers and there, that gets answered in that series. I'm not gonna do that right now. I'm gonna encourage you to, to go back there. So the point to all of that though is I, I wanna go back to why would Jesus be telling us this? Because it, it's really very practical. You see, we also have another misunderstanding and some of us are misunderstanding as well. If I don't do everything in here, it's really not that big of a deal because I don't have to answer for it until I go and stand before God in heaven and then I'm forgiven anyway, so it'll all be just fine. A lot of Christians live like that. But Jesus is actually helping us understand something in the context of the rest of the story that like, this matters before you get to heaven. Does anybody notice the context of the rest of the story? He's talking about storms, that storms are going to come in our lives. Look, if you live in a fallen world, and you do, if you are surrounded by sinful people, and you are, about eight billion of them, by the way. And we have to share a little island together with 330 million of them who think very differently sometimes, don't we? All of which don't glorify God or live according to his code to do nice things. If you live in that world, what Jesus is saying is storms will come. You can't do anything about it. You can't prevent it. You can't stop it. Storms are just gonna come. But what you can do is build your life on such a foundation that that wind, well, it might blow a shutter off, but your house isn't going anywhere. Because the way to build your life on such a foundation, matter of fact, I'm just gonna use a very practical example that I think we're all facing right now, and this is just what I'm being told. I've got uh, several friends that own uh, multi-million dollar businesses, so they're, they're very money smart, and they know what's going on in the world. They use words I don't even understand. And I've got banker friends, they do the same thing. And they all talk and then I just sit there and go, yeah, that's what I think too, so I can appear smart when I really have no clue what's going on. But here's what they all say, is that the United States economy is going to take a downturn in the near future. That, we don't have to, you don't have to agree, I'm just telling you that's what most of the world thinks. And so let's just play along for a minute if that's going to be the case. Well, the case is, even if I know that something is not working the way that it should be, even if I know that there's a downturn coming and even if I want to change that, I can't change the direction of the United States economy by myself. Point being, storms will come into your life you can do nothing about, nothing. All you can do is build your life in such a way, on such a foundation that when the storm comes, you're still standing. Matter of fact, have you ever watched the news after one of those hurricanes or, or tornadoes or something like that and, and people are just standing there going, man, it's the weirdest thing. Like that house over there right beside us, totally destroyed and flattened, but our house is still standing. Isn't that weird? Have you ever noticed people's lives in the world and how some are so devastated and maybe someone who grew up in the same family or someone who works at the same business, they fared the storm with no problem. Here, here, here's the example we're playing with. Like, if the U.S. economy is going to take a, a change and you say, well, I can't stop it, what do I do? Well, we build our life on a foundation. Let's talk about what this says. This says that if we put God first, if we honor him as our provider with the first 10% of everything, he will protect us and our finances. I don't know about you, but if the entire economy of 330 million people is getting ready to crash and I can do nothing but ride along, I would sure love to have God protecting me. And then this also says that you can, you can build that foundation by being a person who saves because you never know what storm might come. That might help. 
And, and then this also says, be a person who plans, budgets, lives below your means, so that when a storm comes, you've got room. Do you see how many things are, are in there that will help us? I, I encourage you, I hope that you're thinking about such things. But here's the reality I have to touch on as well. There are storms that will come you and I can't do anything about. But there are many storms in our lives that you and I actually create. We bring them into our lives. Because we do things that God has told us not to do and we don't build our life on that foundation. We bring the storm and then the house is washed away and then we turn around and yell at God, why'd you let that happen? Like, for instance, have you ever, you ever had a people storm in your life where someone gets mad at you, you get mad at people, suddenly you're not talking to each other, you don't do family Thanksgiving, something like that, don't raise hands? Well, there's a few things in here that maybe could have prevented that. The first one is treat other people the way you wanna be treated. Forgive quickly, don't hold an offense. Also in here, it says, by the way, if you've sinned against somebody, if you've hurt them, go and talk to them quickly. Clear it up. And if someone's hurt you, go and talk to them quickly. Clear it up. Now, that's the storm you and I can prevent. We can't prevent the storm of that person's heart. Unfortunately, sometimes they don't follow Jesus. They don't build their house on this. Sometimes you do have people problems and, and it's not your fault. Sometimes we have marriage problems. Everybody. Anybody, don't raise a hand, ever been in a marriage storm? Well, this says, honor your spouse. Love your spouse, respect your spouse. Love your spouse by keeping no record of wrongs. That's actually how it defines it. Be quick to forgive because you're forgiven. You don't have to wait for an apology. It also says, outdo one another in showing honor and keep your marriage pure. I bet just those things alone would have prevented a lot of marriage storms. Oh, just for the fun of it, I've, I haven't said this yet in any service, so somebody in here needs this. <laughs> it also says, let no unwholesome thing come out of your mouth. Maybe that was for me. That would have saved me a whole lot of pain in my marriage. Y'all know, know when you just, I'm gonna say this just to win the fight. <laughs> Speaking of saying things, you ever been in a gossip storm? Because you wake up the next day and a friend's not talking to you anymore and you find out that that other friend that you thought could keep a secret told them what you said. Well, there is a way to build a foundation in here that says whatever you whisper in the dark will be shouted from the rooftops. And I'll paraphrase the end, so shut up. <laughs> I try to teach people, don't say anything you're not gonna just say to their face because it's gonna end up at their face someday. The point is whatever, the, we can prevent so many of the storms in our lives. And if you haven't thrown anything at me yet, and if I haven't made you uncomfortable yet, I wanna point out one last thing. Some of us voluntarily build our house in a storm zone. Follow this. How many of you remember Hurricane Katrina? This was a perfect example of it. Hurricane Katrina was a horrific hurricane, obviously, that went straight head on across New Orleans and Louisiana. And I learned something about New Orleans I never knew because I've never been there. Actually, I have. But anyway, not, not before the storm. And uh, what I learned, some of you learned as well, there are people there that have built their houses below sea level beside the sea. And I remember when the news was talking about it, I'm thinking, doesn't quite make sense. Well, build my house beside the ocean, lower than the ocean, and hope every day of my life is bright and sunshiny. Just doesn't make sense. It's not very likely to go without rain, sometimes a lot of it. And when they asked people, why, why do you live here? Do you plan on rebuilding? People said, yes. Why do you plan to rebuild? What they said in the news is the same problem you and I have. We love living here. 
There are some of us that love living in our storm zone. Whatever it is, every one of us has something that's in here, that we know is in here, that we do anyway. And we just somehow think we're gonna keep getting away with it every day of our lives. And a storm is never gonna come. And when it does, we yell at God because of our miserable circumstances. Why are we building houses below sea level beside the sea? I think that's a good question God would ask his children. So I, I wanna encourage you with something as, as, as I close today. The Bible says that God has a good plan for our lives. Some of you may know it, Jeremiah 29, 11. It's one of our most quoted verses. Every time we get our, our life into a mess, we're like, but God, the, your Bible promises that you have a good plan for my life, a plan for welfare, a plan to prosper, a plan not to harm. So come on, God. I just wanna ask you a question. Can you imagine for a minute, what if we took God's good plan for our lives and we followed that good plan with unquestioned obedience. And we built our life according to that plan. Can, can you just imagine what our lives might be like? See, let me give you an illustration if I could. Here's what, a good picture. God is the architect. He creates the good plan. And then you and I come along as a rather, excuse me, selfish homeowner who goes out and gets their own contractor license so that they can be totally in charge without anybody else getting up in their business. They look at the blueprints and go, well, I think I can do a little bit better than that. Oh, oh and what? I, I really don't want a mountaintop house. I want one right beside the sea, even if it's a little lower than the sea. And we just go and build our own thing our own way. And then we get upset at God. And I imagine half of the time he'd like to look back from heaven and go, of course I promised I have a good plan for your life. You ever thought about following it? <laughs> Just, I don't know. I didn't tell you to set up shop over there. I didn't tell you to live in a storm zone. I did tell you storms were coming. I mean, I tried. Yeah, and just, just one more thing. Because there are people, I hope there are people here that would say, uh, truth is, Jimmy, I'm pretty good with this. I do not know of anything in here that I willingly go against. I'd like to think there are people here who have been following God long enough that that's where you've arrived at. Now, I'm not saying there's people here who are perfect because we still have blind spots and, and we're not perfect. But I, And I would say I'm one of those people. I don't mean that arrogantly. I would hope you expect that of your pastor. I hope you would think that I do not knowingly do the opposite of this Monday through Saturday. I hope you would think that, right? So. I can tell you there's, there's nothing in here that I believe God has told me to do that I just go, yeah, I won't preach that. I won't talk about it. No, I mean, it's, I try. And again, I have blind spots and, and I've got my own issues. Like I have an anger issue, especially when I drive because people are stupid when they drive and it just comes out of me and it's just not my fault. I was on the interstate yesterday. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna give you an extra story nobody else got. <laughs> I was on the interstate yesterday, big rainstorm comes, and so everybody puts on their flashers and goes slow in the left-hand lane. I'll do a South Carolina PSA for you. Today is August 15th, 2021, and God has answered my prayers. In the state of South Carolina, that is now illegal. You're gonna get a ticket tomorrow. We're gonna have to edit that because I gotta get back to something spiritual here. Let's get back to the point. <laughs> I'm gonna leave you with a thought. You may say I'm pretty good with this, but are you good with everything else God says? See, this is his written voice, but God also has a spiritual voice. If you have made Jesus your King, your Lord and Savior, he puts his spirit inside of you, the Holy Spirit. And God speaks to us through his spirit as well. So some of you may say, hey, Jimmy, I'm good with this. This says be generous, I'm generous. Yeah, how about when that tells you to be generous and the spirit inside of you says be generous right now. You see that family over there? Go pay for their dinner. And you say, but God, everybody's got a steak on that plate. All six of them, six steaks, God. <laughs> I remember about 25 years ago, 
when I was a school teacher and I was working a lot of hours, and I would come home and just want to veg because there wouldn't be many hours. Sometimes I'd get home after dark and leave before the sun again. And that's, I sat, there was a book that, that all of the leaders were reading in our church. And I was just like one of a volunteer leader and thought I could get away with not doing everything. And I didn't really want to read the book and I was tired and I, I sat down on the couch and right beside me on the little end table was, was the book. And right beside the book was the TV remote. God said, read the book. I said, I don't want to. You know what's funny? I read all the time. It's part of my job. I read all the time. I read lots of books. And to this day, that book is still on my shelf and I've never read it. We might be good with some things. We might not be good with other things. God has a good plan for your life. What would happen if we could combine un- questioned obedience to God with his good plan. I think it'd be exciting to find out. So, when Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? Can I paraphrase for you what he was really asking that day? Since he was speaking from the Father's heart. When are you going to let me be God in your life? Let me pray for us. God, we come before you today to say thank you that you are so merciful and so good to us even though we've built our houses not according to your plan and sometimes not even in the, the right place, not even with wisdom. But we thank you that you are a God of redemption God of restoration. Matter of fact, I just want to speak that to someone. I think somebody here needs to hear this. Do not leave today. Do not log off online, kicking yourself, depressed. Here's the good news. Not only is God a great architect, God is a professional house mover. If you have built it in the wrong place, tell him right now, God, I'm sorry. Will you help me rebuild and restore my life according to your plan and in your place? God, that is our prayer. We come before you right now and say, God, whatever it is that we have done that has put us in a place far from you, experiencing storms that you did not intend for us to experience, storms that we should have prevented, could have prevented, God, we ask you right now, forgive us, and would you rebuild, would you restore, would you make whole everything again? God, would you help us to be people who do live according to your perfect plan for our lives? We thank you for your goodness. And we do know your plan is good. Your words are good. God, I pray for anybody who has questions about your word that you will help guide them to the, the answers that they need. Because you are good. If you'll just stay in a place of prayer, I wanna to speak to those of you that have yet to make Jesus your king. Truth is, God does love us so much that he did solve our ultimate problem. He sent his son to die in our place because none of us are perfect and nor will we ever be. And therefore we had no answer. How would we, cre how would we deal with the, the divide that's been created between a holy God and an unholy people? We had no answer, but God did. And that answer is Jesus. It's what we call the free gift of salvation. But every one of us at some point in time has to receive that free gift. We have to trade the life we've been living for the one that he died for and wants to give us. And if you've never done that, I wanna help you do that right now, whether you are here in the room or online, just say something like this to yourself and to God. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for me. And now I choose to live for you. I thank you that you paid the penalty I owed. Thank you that I'm forgiven. And I thank you that you love me. My simple prayer here today is that you fill me with your spirit and give me a life of great meaning in your kingdom. Amen. Everybody help me celebrate with those people. Amen.